Okay, so I want to start off by saying thank you to my mentor, Emmanuel, who was really helpful throughout this whole process. All right. Um, a comprehensive overview of the Australian sea lion, Neofoco scenario, parasitic infections, and treatment. So the Australian, I we decided to go with this topic because the Australian sea lion is something I am really interested in. I'm really interested in pinnipeds in general, which are seals, sea lions, and walruses. So you might ask, what is the Australian sea lion? The Australian sea lion is an endangered species of pinniped endemic to Western and Southern Australia. It is actually the only species of pinniped that is native to Australia. So around the 18th and 19th centuries, a lot of the species of pinnipeds near that part of the world were hunted and fished and their populations were really low. And as a result, a lot of species almost went extinct, and in the case of the Japanese sea lion, some did go extinct. A lot of these species have bounced back, but the Australian sea lion, on the other hand, has not. There were only around 10,000 individuals in, left in the wild. Some of the threats to the Australian sea lion include fishery traps, heavy metal pollutants, parasites, and entanglement. One of the reasons why the Australian likely has such a high, has such a low population is because the pups have a really high mortality, up to 44.6%. They also have a really high neonatal anemia rate. Now, neonatal anemia is really common in pinniped pups as a result of just being born in the huge environmental changes between being a, a fetus and being a self-sustaining organism. The Australian sea lion has a 100% infection rate of eusanguinous and a high A microture infestation rate, over, greater than 70%. Most pups are infected with parasites from the time they are born. This review discusses the parasites affecting the sea lion, Australian sea lion population. These parasites are likely to be responsible for the high pup mortality rate. These parasitic infections are, infecti are affecting the species so much and if we don't if we don't make efforts to bring the species back to normal populations the species could go extinct and these parasites and the pup mortality are likely contributing to this if the species continues to have low populations extinction may occur so to start off, let's talk about the reproductive biology of the Australian sea lion. Unlike most pinnipeds and other mammals, the Australian sea lion has an asynchronous breeding cycle, which means it breeds every 18 months rather than every year, which means that the season in which the Australian sea lion breeds changes every year or so. They breed in the summer and winter months, and these summer and winter month breeding cycles show fluctuations in pup mortality rates. In 2017, the summer breeding season was found to have the highest pup mortality rate. The Australian sea lion also has a really long lactation period of 15 to 18 months. At one month of age, the pups start to enter water. They'll start swimming around two months, and they start diving around three months. At five months, they will start to move farther away from their mother, but they are reliant on their mother for food until they are fully weaned. Australian sea lions also have a really old sexual maturity age at five years for males and three years for females. All right, so in the top left, you can see a mother with a pup. Because the coat is so dark, you can tell that this is a younger pup. In the bottom left, you can see a male Australian sea lion that is an adult. You can tell that he is an adult and that he is male because one, he is larger than females, and two, sexually mature males have a white fork, has have a white top of their head. To the bottom middle, you can see two Australian sea lion pups. These pups are likely around five months of age, so they're starting to swim on their own. And to the far right, you can see some newborn pups. The Australian sea lion is affected by a myriad of parasites, but three the three that we decided to study in this review are Uncanaria sanguinis, Antarctothyrus microchair, and Toxoplasmus gondii. To start up, Uncanaria sanguinis. Uncanaria is a genus of nematodes that affect the small intestine. They affect all mammals. Uncanaria sanguinis only affects the Australian sea lion, however. Uncanaria sanguinis uh, infects pups through lactation. They receive the infection first through the colostrum, which is the mother's first milk. Adults 
often recover when they are pups and then get affected again when they are adults? And if so, they are infected through eggs laid in feces. These eggs will either be ingested or ingested or um, infect the adults via dermal contact. When they hatch, they will mat eventually mature into third stage infective, infective larvae, at which point they will migrate to the abdominal blubber. If an Australian sea lion is a female, these will remain dormant until they start lactating. If it is a male, the infection will begin. Within 24 hours of being born, Australian sea lion pups are already infected with eusanguinous. For the first 11 to 14 days, the infection is prepotent, which means there is no symptoms or really effect. You can tell that the infection is patent when there are eggs in feces. 100% of pups found dead from the ages of 12 to 57 days were found positive for hookworm. All dead pups found have, that are negative for hookworm were either stillborn or they were dead before they had even lactated, making it impossible for them to have already contracted hookworm. This further solidifies the evidence that the pup mortality is linked to eusanguinous. Eusanguinous also results in a lot of neonatal anemia, which could be the cause of the pup mortality. In 2015, studies began uh, finding the exact impact that, the, that this species of hookworm was having on the Australian sea lion. It results in a low packed cell volume, a lower red blood cell count, a higher eosinophil response, and lower total plasma protein. Lower PCV, RBC, and TPP indicate hemorrhagic anemia, which are characteristic of a parasitic infection, directly linking eusanguinous to the neonatal anemia. This also strongly indicates that the pup mortality is linked to eusanguinous because the anemia that eusanguinous causes is pretty severe. Next, a microchair, a sucking louse. A microchair is a hematophagous sucking louse, which is a member of the seal lice family. So these only affect seals and sea lions. A microchair, however, only affects sea lions. It is better known for affecting South American sea lions. Because it is a sucking louse, it is only, only able to live on the hair. So eggs are also laid on the hair, which means that you won't find these on the flippers or the nose. Uh, some adaptations that these creatures have to be able to feed off of the Australian sea lion are these parasites are able to tolerate really high pressures and they can withstand the diving depth that Australian sea lions dive to. They can't, however, withstand it well until nymphal stage three. They also cannot tolerate salinity until nymphal stage two, which means that for most of their life, they have to live ashore. Eggs can only be laid on land. They cannot get wet or they will die. So they spend around 79, seven to nine days as an egg. And in each nymphal stage, there are three to four days. In total, it takes one month for a microchair to um, grow up. The long time that I spent at shore that an Australian pu sea lion pup experience allows for the breeding cycles of a microchair and the Australian sea lion to sink. This allows for pups to have um, infection from birth. A microchair is also passed down to pups via lactation and from the gregariousness of other pups. A microchair results in anemia similar to eusanguinous. However, the anemia that these guys that, that these guys experience as a result of a microchair is much milder. It's a, there's around a 70% prevalence of a microchair in the population. If an infection is severe, it will result in pruritus, which is severe itching, alopecia, which is loss of hair, and severe anemia. While a microchair definitely contributes to neonatal anemia, it likely isn't the source of high pup mortality. However, it does weaken the species as a whole. And finally, T. gondii. Toxoplasmosis is a well-known protozoan parasite affecting humans and mammals. You must have heard of toxoplasmosis before as it's recommended for pregnant mothers to not go near cats or cat litter in general so that they don't contract toxoplasmosis because cats are the most well-known hosts of toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis, however, unlike eusanguinous and A. microchair, don't, doesn't result in hematological effects at the start. They first start off with neurological effects, specifically encephalitis and neonatal mortality. 
Toxoplasmosis can infect fetuses while they are still in their mother's uterus. Infection passes through the placenta, which is why it's recommended for pregnant mothers to not go near cat litter. In the Australian sea lion, infection is primarily transmitted through the ingestion of oocysts or tissue cysts. Oocysts are basically the egg sacs, and when they are sporulated, they are infective. They differentiate into their next stage of life called tachyzoites, which reproduce really quickly and form brachyzoites, which reproduce much slower. Brachyzoites are present in chronic infections and are found in hundreds in tissue cysts. Feral cats are a large source of oocysts. Two of the largest breeding colonies of the Australian sea lion, Dangerous Reef and Seal Bay and Kangaroo Island, have huge feral cat populations, which makes toxoplasmosis a huge threat to the population. However, there is only around 30.4 prevalence in the Australian sea lion population. Plus, the Australian sea lion only is affected by toxoplasmosis when they are adults. No cases were recorded of pups in the study published in 2019. Pachyzoids and tissue cysts are found concentrated in the brain and heart, causing encephalitis, which is swelling of the brain, and myocarditis. As a result, it's unlikely that anemia is being caused by toxoplasmosis. And thus, toxoplasmosis is ultimately not responsible for the anemia and the pup mortality. However, it could be a potential threat to the Australian sea lion because since the species is already so weak, if this infection enters the population, it could have devastating results. Now, here's the question. How do we solve this? There's a question of whether or not we even saw this at all because the Australian sea lion population is a free-ranging population. So is it ethical to get involved at all? However, if you are to get involved, studies have been done regarding ivermectin as a potential solution for you sanguinous and amicrature. Ivermectin is an antiparasitic drug which is used really frequently in dogs and cats. Like if your dog has dewormer, they're likely treating your dog with ivermectin. In this study, ivermectin was found to be 97.9% effective at eliminating eusanguinous and also sim and similarly effective at eliminating a microture. Both topical and injectable ivermectin have similar effects. So the method of administration doesn't affect the doesn't affect the effectiveness. 20 days after initial administration, significant reduction in hookworm was found, with 96.4% decrease in topical ivermectin and 96.8% decrease with injectable ivermectin. There was a similar success with a micature, but with a little bit less reduction at 62.7% reduction with topical ivermectin and 59.4% with injectable ivermectin. Ultimately, there was no statistically significant difference between topical and injectable ivermectin in terms of effectiveness. Both in ivermectin function to solve the problem of anemia. However, there was one fluke. PPP results were unexpected and unaccounted for. This change, however, although it quickly resolved itself, TPP was lower for a significant portion of time, which is the opposite of the desired effect. This is a potential study, this is a potential area for researchers to look into in further study. And here are the effects of ivermectin on blood parameters. As you can see, total plasma protein decreased with ivermectin, which still hasn't really been looked into, and the cause is unaccounted for and unexpected. Ivermectin also appears to have no other adverse effects on the Australian sea lion except for the decrease in TPP. There were no reactions to the medication and it ultimately appears to be a pretty safe drug, which could potentially positively affect pup mortality and be a really good solution for these low populations. However, further research needs to be done regarding the effect of ivermectin on mortality. The studies done of ivermectin were really limited because they only had a certain amount of time. But over the course of several years, we could tell if ivermectin successfully decreases pup mortality in these experimental groups. There is a study that is ongoing by Dr. Rachel Gray at the University of Sydney, Australia. And finally, discussion. This research was definitely really comprehensive, but there were a lot of gaps in the research because the Australian sea lion is a widely understudied species. To begin, there is no definite link proven between pup mortality and the parasites. 
Further research should be done into the effect of ivermectin on mortality in further clinical trials to make sure that this is safe for a free-ranging species, as well as ethical considerations of whether or not we should be treating a free-ranging species at all. Also, a microchure is severely understudied in the Australian sea lion. Some safeguards should also be taken regarding toxoplasmosis and the Australian sea lion. It's really important to do research on the Australian sea lion and similar populations. It's an endangered species in a really crucial part of the Australian marine ecosystem. These parasites are weakening the species as a whole and will make it harder for the species to bounce back in future years. It's important to keep this species extant and not go extinct like its other counterparts.